So it's my um, distinct pleasure today to welcome Jason Shepard to the EV Journal Club. Uh, so Jason is somebody that I've known um, for quite some time because he was a graduate student at Johns Hopkins um, around the time that I was also here. Um, and I'm still here, as a matter of fact. Uh, but Jason has moved to the University of Utah, um, where he is doing some, some fascinating work. And I think you all know that, and that's why you're here today. Um, on the mechanisms that viruses use um, to package their genetic material and how these mechanisms might be related to, um, to what extracellular vesicles do. Um, so it's really, uh, really great that Jason agreed to come back to, uh, to Johns Hopkins virtually today for our, our journal club. Um, and I think that, um, that we're gonna really um, learn a lot from his presentation. So uh, Jason, thanks for joining us and um, it's all yours. Awesome. Thanks, Ken. Um, all right. So this is working. Everyone can see the screen. Um, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to um, come, come back virtually. This is actually my first Zoom seminar, so we'll see how this goes. And um, I'm particularly excited to present to this community because um, we're not extracellular vesicle experts per se. Uh, we sort of stumbled on, on to this biology and I'll, I'll talk about how we uh, did do that. Uh, so I welcome feedback at the end and, and discussion. I think there, there'll be a lot of uh, talking points and, and uh, certainly my worth questions. Okay, so of course, um, most of the work uh, that I'm gonna talk about is done by these guys in the lab. Um, in fact, this is a, a picture we took last year and uh, the, the lab has grown, but I'll mention who's done the work as we go along. So really my, uh, my lab is interested in how cells in the brain store information and, and basically trying to understand uh, the molecular mechanisms of memory. Uh, and from a cell biology perspective, problem because the brain has to be plastic and has to allow learning to occur, um, but also, also mediate um, consolidation of information for minutes to hours to up to a lifetime. Um, and so the question is at the cell biology level, how do you balance this plasticity and um, constant protein turnover in cells with this long-term storage of information? And so we take a, a couple of approaches to this where in a neuroscience lab, and so we, um, we can look at how neural circuits adapt during learning. Um, this is a mouse brain that we're imaging in vivo, looking at calcium imaging as a proxy for neuronal activity. Um, but really what we're interested in is how the, the, the connections between these cells, the synapses, uh, change during learning, and how do these synaptic connections can mediate information storage in the brain. And then, of course, uh, what are the proteins involved in uh, regulating synaptic function? Uh, and so I know this is probably a diverse crowd, so just you know, neuroscience 101 here. Uh, this is the sy synapse. And of course, the synapse converts electrical activity into chemical transmission where neurotransmitters release when an action potential comes down. Uh, and it's these receptors on the, on the other side of the synapse then uh, that get activated by these neurotransmitters, uh, neurotransmitters that allow um, ionic conductance and then depolarizes this, this neuron and um, that's how the, the action potential is propagated from cell to cell. So this is obviously a very simplistic view. There's, there's hundreds of proteins on each side of the synapse that can regulate the function. But in really simplistic terms, we think that the way information is encoded and stored in the brain is through these, um, through changes in these synapses. And so you can study memory, of course, at uh, various uh, uh, temporal and spatial scales, everything from that action potential uh, and neuronal activity that happens within the millisecond range, all the way to new protein synthesis and gene expression, uh, which takes, of course, minutes to hours. And it's this particular, this last stage that we're particularly interested in because we know that if you block protein synthesis, you block the ability for um, 
information to be stored and, and long-term consolidation. Uh, and so just a few other aspects of, of neurons that of course make, make it um, interesting from a cell biology perspective. This is one pyramidal neuron that contains thousands of synapses. And if we think that each one of these synapses can act as a, an autonomous uh, unit, and one way is in fact to have transcription in the cell body and then uh, transport of mRNA uh, out to these dendrites uh, where there's local translation um, of specific mRNAs. And this can happen in a very rapid way. And so it's one easy um, cell biology mechanism to replenish or uh, boost uh, expression of a specific protein at a single synapse. So just to summarize then what we think is going on in terms of memory storage, there's rapid transcription when you learn. And some of these RNAs that are uh, transcribed are actually trafficked out into the dendrites where um, they can be then locally translated. And then some of these proteins that are made at those synapses uh, are really the effective protein, the function and structure of these synapses. And some of the processes that they regulate include actin remodeling, membrane, membrane trafficking, and then of course, um, dynamic uh, protein complexes and regulating these uh, complicated uh, scaffolds at synapses. So of course this then begs the question, what are the key uh, genes that are induced by learning? And um, so I've, pretty, I've taken a very um, single-minded approach to this question in that I've studied uh, one gene uh, for most of my brain, and this gene is called ARC. Uh, ARC. So in fact, this is a, a, a gene that was originally cloned um, by Paul Woolley's group at Johns Hopkins uh, in tandem with another group um, Cool's group, and they, um, they called it R3.1. But um, uh, Paul's group called it ARC, uh, naming it after activity regulated cytoskeletal protein. Um, and this, this image really highlights why it was so uh, interesting uh, even at, in the get-go. So this is in situ hybridization for ARC mRNA. And this is a rat that was um, uh, sacrificed right after it, uh, it was housed in its home cage. And this was a rat that was allowed to explore a novel environment for an hour. So just this one hour of exploration induces the transcription of ARC mRNA in the cortex of the rat, so this is the cortex, and then this structure here called the hippocampus, um, and this is the, the blow up of the hippocampus, and this is the structure that we know is absolutely required to convert short-term into long-term memory. It's required for storing memories, at least in the initial stages of consolidation. Uh, and so the other striking aspect of this uh, expression, of course, is that you can see this is the cell body layer, this fuzzy staining here is where those dendrites are and those synaptic connections. So this was the first observation of an mRNA that could actively uh, be transported into the, the dendrites of the hippocampus. Uh, and so Oz Stewart with Paul uh, went on to show that you could also uh, actually artificially induce arc expression by sticking an electrode into the hippocampus and inducing um, high frequency stimulation, which is a proxy for uh, how we think uh, information is encoded into the campus. Uh, and again, what was striking is that within a few minutes, you would get a regulation of mRNA in the cell body layer, uh, but then you would get a striking redistribution of the mRNA to active synapses. This layer here is where the, the stimulating electrode is activating um, uh, the, this particular pathway. And so there's really exquisite um, expression and tracking of the um, ARC mRNA. So of course, this also suggests that there should be uh, local translation in these dendrites. And uh, I like this experiment from Kim Huber's lab where they took those hippocampal slices and actually sent the dendrites away from the cell body, added an agonist to a neurotransmitter receptor that's known to induce translation in neurons and then look for ARC protein expression 
in this in these dendrites uh, within a few minutes of this application of this drug. And you can see that uh, there's an increase in ARC protein in the dendrites, even if they're severed from the cell body, really definitely showing that you can get local translation within uh, dendrites that does not uh, result from trafficking or rapid trafficking of protein from the cell body. So this regulation, the key uh, pathways that feed into this regulation, we think are then uh, integral for just normal synaptic function and cognition. Uh, the boxes here are not important, but just to say that the red boxes are all known human mutations that can cause intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorders. Um, and why we think, again, that ARC is an interesting gene to study is because we think that it lies downstream uh, at the end stages of many of these pathways. And so it is one of the uh, more important uh, effector proteins at synapses. So just to summarize what we know, uh, we, we know that you can get rapid transcription with a neuronal activity and transport of ARC mRNA. Um, we know some of the control of this, the, the trafficking of the RNAs mediated, we think, by the 3' ETR of ARC. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about um, some of this regulation. Okay, so just a little bit more information about um, ARC. It's a single copy gene, but I'll get more into that later. Uh, it's a classic uh, immediate early gene, and that just means that you don't need new protein synthesis for its uh, synthesis, so you get rapid uh, induction. Um, and because ARC transcription is so finely coupled to experience and learning, uh, a lot of neuroscientists have actually used this ARC uh, induction as a, a marker for which uh, neurons in, in a brain are actually active during um, uh, activity or, or an experience. And then finally, ARC is not a transcription factor. So a lot of the classic immediate early genes that you may have heard of, like CFOS, um, are transcription factors. Uh, and so we think then that it's actually, again, at the end point of some of these uh, cascades. And it's, it's pretty, uh, only expressed in brain with some expression in the testes and in a, a specific dendritic immune cell, um, which I think is intriguing that we're sort of looking at. And then within the brain, it's only in a particular kind of uh, neuron, these excitatory neurons, which are the, the dominant uh, neurons in the brain. And so the ARC transcription does not happen in other cell types, we think, in, in, um, uh, in the brain, like glia. And then within um, the brain, it's only, uh, within neurons, it's only in a postsynaptic um, cell inside of the synapse. Uh, and so all that regulation then suggested that it should be important for um, synaptic plasticity and functioning of um, uh, cognition. And indeed, if you take out ARC, so these are germline knockout mice, uh, the brain is actually wired up normally, so development of the brain seems to be pretty much normal, uh, at least embryonic. Uh, but these mice are unable to remember anything. So these are multiple kinds of behavioral tests that you can put a mouse through. And um, basically, the, the, the gist of this is that any um, any uh, memory task that we've looked at, and others, learning is intact, so the brain is able to encode information. Short-term memory is intact, so you know minutes uh, we're talking about is also intact. But then, if you come back a day later, there's basically no recall of the learning experience, and so it's it's a really severe but specific defect in this consolidation um, of, of memory. Uh, and so the first clue to what ARC may be doing in uh, cells came with uh, this and Paul Woolley's group. And some of the uh, uh, proteins here you, you may be familiar with. So the two that we pulled out were endophilin and dynamin. And these are two classic endocytosis proteins that are involved in all classroom dependent endocytosis events. Uh, and so this, of course, suggested that maybe ARC was involved in uh, membrane trafficking. And it's been known for a long time that the w one way to uh, change the strength of synapses is to just change the amount of receptors at the synapse. 
Um, and so one can take again those hippocampal slices and record from them and be able to determine what the strength of a specific synapse is. In this case, these are synapses that are coming from the CA3 region to the CA1. Um, and so you can take a baseline and then induce plasticity. And the two main kinds of plasticity that we know of um, that regulate the strength of synapses is long-term potentiation and long-term depression. So basically this just means that there's a sustained increase in um, synaptic strength or a sustained decrease. Um, and so we then hypothesize, of course, that ARC would be regulating these kinds of um, plasticity mechanisms uh, by trafficking the receptors um, at the synapse. So these blue may receptors can be inserted into the membrane and then trafficked to synapses and then out of the synapse and then finally in the cytosis. And so we thought then that ARC would regulate this endocytosis event. Um, and indeed that was the case. And so this just, just summarizes that work where um, we think that then that one, one role of ARC in cells is to regulate uh, by regulating these endocytosis proteins, endothelin and dynamin. Um, and because of this, we thought then that ARC would be involved in a depression-like mechanism, the LTD, and that is indeed the case. Um, this is work in my life from Maddie, uh, Maddie Kirk-Smith, and so she looked at um, LTD in wild-type mice, and this is the, the depression that you normally see in wild-type mice. But these ARC knockout mice uh, basically have no LTD at all. So this particular uh, plasticity mechanism is deficient in uh, ARC knockout mice. But um, this LTP mechanism potentiation seems to be uh, mostly intact. Um, if you look at regular induction of LTP, um, and in fact, in some, in some formats, uh, some kinds of uh, LTP, there's an enhancement. So this is just to say that then one role for ARC is, involved, is, is, um, is to regulate the strength of the to um, switch gears and, and come into the work that you're probably most um, uh, interested in. But I just wanted to give that background context to why we think this particular uh, gene is really important for uh, the function of um, normal brain, uh, uh, brain memory mix. This work um, that I'm going to now describe uh, was initially spearheaded by Alyssa and Cameron in the lab. Uh, and this was published a few years ago now in, in Cell. Um, but Rachel and Jen and Mike um, are continuing on with some of the uh, questions that have arisen from this work. Uh, and really, it all started from uh, a question that we had about how ARC protein could regulate those endocytosis uh, events. And um, one way to do that was to take a really, um, you know, reductionist approach, look at the biomistry of ARC protein itself. And to, and to do that, we, um, we expressed ARC and bacteria using uh, just normal affinity purification uh, protocols where we would tag ARC with a GST tag. And so um, we would get nice expression of ARC in our bacteria. He has the untagged version and then we could cleave the tagged version from, um, from the bacteria. And uh, so at this point, we thought, great, we have this pure population of ARC protein to study. Um, but we started to get some weird results when we uh, ran it through this last step, which is to separate out the, um, the protein by size using a size exclusion column. Um, and so this is where we expected come out in the column because it was uh, about 45 kb uh, but this is what we observed so this is uh, the void fraction and this is where most of the protein was getting stuck so at this point we thought okay uh, well and we being Nate Yoda who was my first technician in the lab uh, we thought we were just bad at purifying protein and uh, we didn't know what we were doing so uh, Nate was working with Adam Frost's group who, who were experts in uh, purifying protein. 
And no matter what we did to the buffer conditions, um, we just always got most of the protein in this fraction. So we almost gave up on these experiments. We thought maybe, or most likely, this was because the protein was aggregating or it was sticky and it was useless to, to study. Uh, but Nate wanted to learn how to use the electron microscope. And uh, since Adam's lab was also an expert in that, he, um, he helped Nate do that. And so we took the protein from this fraction, put it on the EM grid. And these are literally the first images we got from that experiment. So of course, these, uh, these large soccer ball structures um, are not what we expected. And when I first saw these, this was sort of a moment where you, I, I either thought this is going to be a totally interesting finding that could blow up the, the story of ARC, or it's an artifact that we, somehow our bacteria were contaminated with something. Um, so of course, uh, I'm telling you this because it, it wasn't the latter. So these structures are being made by ARC protein itself, but they're large. They're almost 100 nanometers in, uh, in diameter. Uh, and so uh, b being a neuroscientist and not a virologist, um, these were somewhat familiar to me and I couldn't really put my, uh, uh, I couldn't really figure out exactly what they were, but I was, but luckily I had colleagues at Utah that are virologists and they were, they were like, well, it looks like you have a retrovirus in your protein prep. And I'm like, well, that's impossible. This is a neuronal gene, um, so you must be wrong. <laughs> uh, but it turns out that um, we purify the GAG protein from HIV, and of course, Ken is an expert, you know, he knows more about this than me. Uh, but GAG itself is necessary and sufficient to form the viral capsid for HIV. And in some cases, when you purify HIV capsids, this is what they look like under EM. So um, if I didn't put the titles here, you wouldn't really be able to distinguish the two. Uh, and, and so indeed, these ARC uh, structures look very much like the HIV uh, capsid. And the same time that these experiments, uh, Paul Woolley's group published a paper in Neuron sh definitely showing that the structure of the C-terminus of ARC does indeed uh, resemble the GAG, the CA domain of GAG, HIV GAG, uh, to the point where you can almost overlay them perfectly together. So this is the, the N lobe and the C lobe of, um, of the CA domain of um, ARC and, and HIV. So this was a crystal structure and you know, normally structure follows function and, and, and for functions uh, follow structure. Uh, and so this really gave us uh, confidence that this wasn't a weird spurious result um, that ARC was able to form these capsids, presumably because it had this uh, CA-like domain um, in the protein. And of course, it turns out that, you know, we always think that we're clever in science, but oftentimes someone else has already thought of it. So this was a paper in 2006 um, by a group at uh, use computational approaches to predict um, which genes, human genes, contain potentially uh, homology to the retroviral uh, proteins. And if you just look at the GAG protein here, um, there's actually quite a few genes and gene families that contain uh, the CA domain. I'll come back to that uh, implication later on. But what they predicted was that, in fact, ARC did have this CA-like domain and maybe even a putative MA domain um, of GAG. So, um, so this, this then gave us confidence that what we we're studying was potentially um, uh, really an interesting aspect of ARC protein. And so we collaborated with uh, Cedric Bashat group when he was at Utah, and Cedric is a, an expert in retrotransposons. And so you may know that retrotransposons um, are very similar to retroviruses. They often contain uh, many of the same domains, like the GAG and the POL um, domains. Uh, the retroviruses, though, um, usually contain the envelope uh, protein. 
but there's a debate of where whether the retrotransposons are ancestral to retroviruses or um, whether retrotransposons just lost some of the abilities of um, those retroviruses. But in any case, um, Cedric and John showed with their phylogenetic um, analysis that the, the mammalian arc we were studying is actually derived from a retrotransposon, in particular this gypsy family, uh, this TY3 gypsy family. And um, we know that ARC is highly conserved between mammals and, and birds, but there's actually no fish ARC gene. And the closest relative, um, or the closest sequence, in fact, is a active retrotransposon in a coelacanth. Uh, we know it's active because it still contains these LTR um, uh, motifs. So that was, you know, fairly straightforward. Um, and this suggested that ARC was a, basically a repurposed retrotransposon and that this insertion event happened somewhere um, between fish and land animals about 400 million years ago. Um, but there was another puzzle here, which is that um, we actually knew that there was this fly homologue um, and Vivian Budnick's group, in fact, been working on the fly homologue uh, of ARC. Um, and uh, this was a puzzle, of course, if you don't have it in fish, why would you have it in insects? Uh, but it turns out that this is actually a much more recent repurposing event that the ancestral um, uh, sequence, the closest sequence, is other insect retrotransposons. In fact, most other insects don't seem to have this gene. Um, and so basically evolution has repurposed this gag uh, domain from this retrotransposon family at least twice. Um, and I'll get back to why we think that's really quite interesting. And, you know, so this is just, um, just to say that um, the more that we study the, the, the evolution of, of genes, the more we realize that a lot of uh, new genes can be co-opted from these transposable elements. Um, but I think what is quite interesting and what I think we'll, uh, you know, what we'll, we can discuss is that many functions of the original transposable element or retro element um, have been re retained by these new genes for uh, uh, physiology. Okay, so um, again, a neuroscientist had really no idea what GAG was. <laughs> and, um, and so we sort of took a crash course in uh, retrovirology. Um, and again, this is a, a, simplifies, a simplified version of the life cycle of, um, of GAG. Uh, gag in an infected cell uh, is normally uh, a polyprotein. It's not cleaved. And this, uh, this polyprotein is a monomer initially. And then in a series of complicated events, um, the, the monomers are seated at the plasma membrane where they start to form the capsid. And as they form this, this capsid, they actually uh, in, start to encapsulate the viral RNA. And then finally, as the capsid is almost formed, um, it interacts with host cell machinery that you, of course, are quite familiar with, these escort proteins. And it's these escort proteins that finally allow the, the capsid to leave the cell uh, to form the, the infectious particle. Uh, in the case of HIV and GAG, uh, they also, the GAG also recruits the envelope protein, the transmembrane protein that confers specificity of where uh, the, the infectious particles can interact and be taken up. And then finally, um, there is a protease that cleaves the, the GAG protein. Um, this is the mature form uh, of the capsid. So we, um, at this point, we took a very, again, a naive approach potentially by saying that, well, if ARC has structure like GAG and, 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 and some biochemistry that, that resembles GAG, uh, what aspects of this uh, uh, process of GAG um, have been retained in uh, an ARC, uh, ARC gene? So we asked these questions. Uh, does ARC self-assemble into capsids? We already knew that. Um, does ARC then interact with nucleic acids uh, like RNA? Uh, and then does ARC get out of the cell um, potentially uh, in some sort of vesicle? And if so, if, if it does get out of a cell, uh, can it transmit or deliver uh, RNA from cell to cell? 
Uh, so ARC forms these capsids, and uh, one of the nice things about uh, the EM uh, is that we we know that we we uh, these capsids are intact under ice conditions. So using cryo EM, um, we've been collaborating with John Briggs at the um, LMB in, in Cambridge to try and reconstruct uh, the these cry the, the the cryo EM images of uh, our caps is to try and get a, a really high resolution structure. Um, one aspect of the mammalian purified protein, though, is that there is some heterogeneity in the size of these uh, capsids, and that has been um, uh, a bit of a problem to get really, really high resolution uh, structures because you need a, a homogeneous set of particles. Um, but as I mentioned, there's that fly protein, and so we were also intrigued to know whether this DRC1 protein could also form capsids. And indeed, just using very similar protein purification steps, we do see uh, capsids, and these um, fly capsids do look very similar to uh, the mammalian capsids, capsids, at least by negative stain EM. And in fact, um, we just published this uh, recently in January. Uh, John has now reconstructed, uh, or Simon in John's lab has reconstructed these uh, fly arc capsids. Um, and I won't go into detail of the structure, but just to say, you know, if you just look at these, one, they're beautiful, and two, uh, if I didn't know that this was an actual animal protein, I would have thought this is some sort of new virus. Um, and so there's very uh, interesting aspects of the structures that, that, that um, uh, Simon has uh, got, including these little spike domains, these spiky bits that are sticking out of the, the capsid. Um, and so this, this could potentially be interacting uh, points with uh, membrane or, or um, uh, proteins. And then inside the capsid, there's these domains that we predict um, are uh, RNA binding domains. Um, and so, uh, the, the real take home here though is that uh, these structures do look very similar to actual retrovirus capsids. And so um, it's unlikely that of course that, that um, the ability to form these capsids is, is uh, something that is not important because this would have been lost during evolution. Uh, so one, um, you know, one important um, uh, use of the structures that we can use these structures to predict um, subunit mutations that would then hopefully inter interfere with the ability of um, ARC to form these oligomersion capsids, and this would be uh, a key reagent. And so um, we think that we've got a mutation in that CA domain that can cause um, uh, a monomer to form. So this is um, this is the elution from that uh, size exclusion column. And again, this is where most of our protein uh, comes out in the void fraction. And this mutation completely shifts the, uh, the protein from a, a, an oligomer to a monomeric state. And under EM conditions, um, we really don't see uh, formation of these um, nice looking capsids. So um, having the structure in hand, even though this is the the fly structure, and this is the mammalian protein, it's helped us uh, figure out a way to interfere with uh, capsid assembly, and this will be an important rate reagent going forward to test the function um, of the capsid. So of course, there's a lot to do still. Um, I'm gonna sort of summarize as I go along what we still are working on and what we would love to um, figure out. So. Um, we still are working on the uh, reconstruction of the mammalian arc capsid. Um, we would love to identify in situ, in cells, in, in a brain, uh, capsid structures and um, you know, figure out where they assemble. But because they're still below 100 nanometers or roughly around 100 nanometers, that we really need to be able to do correlated light EM um, and super, super resolution imaging. And so, um, we're collaborating with uh, Eric Jorgensen's group at Utah to do that. And then, of course, uh, like HIV capsids in cell, we think there must be uh, cofactors and other proteins that can regulate the assembly um, and other post, potentially post-translational modifications 
that regulate uh, assembly of the capsids. Okay, so this arc bind nucleic acids. And so we, we, because we thought that the capsids were forming inside um, or were able to form with the bacterial lysate, um, we actually took out those capsids and then did uh, RT-PCR uh, to look for ARC mRNA, predicting that if there's any RNA that's going to be in these capsids, it could be uh, its own message. Um, and indeed, when we looked at these capsids alone, we could, we could detect ARC mRNA um, in these capsids. And if it is in the capsid, then we would predict that it should be uh, protected from exogenous um, RNAs that we added to the test tube. And that is the case that if we add RNAs, the detectability of ARC mRNA is unchanged. Uh, what was intriguing is that when we looked at a highly abundant uh, bacterial mRNA, even though it's tenfold less expressed than ARC, we could still see evidence that uh, these capsids also contain this highly abundant um, bacterial mRNA, suggesting that the specificity of, of uh, encapsulation, at least in this recombinant assay, is, is, uh, is not high. But this is just a control that if you add exogenous GFP RNA to the same test tube, the RNA is, is active. Uh, so we would obviously love to know whether ARC is uh, interacting with RNAs uh, in, in a brain. Um, and so this is a, a first step to do that, where we immunoprecipitated ARC protein from mouse um, RNA, uh, mouse brain, and then looked for ARC mRNA, so we can enrich with the protein. And then this protein complex uh, that we pulled out does indeed uh, have an enrichment for ARC mRNA as a, a, a as opposed to a highly abundant housekeeping RNA. Uh, but of course, this only says, says that ARC is in a complex with its own mRNA, doesn't say that it's necessarily in a capsid. Um, and so we, you know, one question that we still have is um, if ARC is binding RNA and encapsulating RNA, we'd love to know what other RNAs are um, potentially being encapsulated. Um, and this is very preliminary uh, that that we're still trying to figure out uh, conditions for. But if we look at what other RNAs are in this IP, when we sequence, um, we actually see it for non coding RNAs, and in, in particular, some of these uh, long non coding RNAs. Um, and so we, of course, are quite interested in some of these um, and trying to validate um, going forward um, whether there are real interactions and uh, potentially. Um, as we'll get to the next stage, whether there are actually in these extracellular vesicles that ARC is making. Um, and then uh, just, just one final aspect of the capsid assembly is that we think that if you take out the RNA or nucleic acids, then you disrupt the formation of these capsids. And this is very similar to HIV as well. And then if you add back RNA to this preparation, you start to see reformation of the capsids. Um, and, you know, this is actually an interesting um, observation and something that we will, uh, that we're actually exploring in terms of um, using these R capsids as deliver delivery vehicles for um, potentially for gene therapy and other uh, applications. Uh, so again, many questions. Is there what is the RNA specificity in terms of its interaction? Is, is there a specificity or is this a charge uh, interaction? Uh, what kind of RNAs can be encapsulated? Uh, what part of ARC protein actually does interact with the RNAs? And then, as I mentioned, um, we're sort of exploring some uh, translational aspects of this, and I'm happy to uh, talk about that as well. Okay, so finally, I know it's taken me 40 minutes to get to this point, but um, the, this was sort of the, one of the harder um, aspects of, of ARC uh, biology that I had to get my head around because we had, as I talked about in the beginning, we had all this exquisite regulation of where ARC was made and that it had to be at specific synapses. So why would it get released from a cell? Because you, then you would lose uh, a lot of that synapse specificity. And that's still a question that, that we're trying to figure out. But all of the, bi the biology then predicted that this is something that should happen. 
Um, and then again, of course, I don't have to um, explain this to this group. Uh, but the fact that, that um, these retroviruses, many viruses have taken advantage of host cell biology uh, to form these viral particles um, suggested that these, um, this kind of biology is something that happens normally in cells. And of course, extracellular vesicles uh, are generated using very similar mechanisms, either through uh, escort activity directly at the plasma membrane uh, or through uh, invagination of intraluminal vesicles and MVBs. Uh, where you finally get exosomes. Um, so, uh, you know, I think this is, of course, very interesting in terms of cell-to-cell -cell communication in the nervous system, um, both in the, the normal physiology context as well as the, the disease context. Um, and I think we're just now getting to the point where we're trying to understand the biology of um, extracellular vesicles in neurons. And I would say, like, many other cell types, of course, you do get generation of exosomes and other kinds of these, uh, but the, the actual cell, bi cell biology still needs to be really figured out. Um, and so, you know, we think then that these vesicles could act as signals to other cells or, and or they could also be mechanisms to eliminate toxic proteins from cells. Many of the uh, uh, misfolded proteins that are uh, the toxic culprits in neurodegenerative disorders have been implicated in EVs, as you guys know, and that um, potentially these EVs could then be um, degraded or, or taken up by other cell types like microglia. So we, um, so again, we asked this question, of, well, if we take primary cultured cells, neurons, and then um, isolate extracellular vesicles from media, would we see ARC protein? Um, so this is the one of the original experiments we did in the cell paper. This is um, running the media through ultra centrifugation steps, and then finally through a 20% sucrose cushion. Um, and so in that pellet fraction is where we expect the extracellular vesicles to be. Um, and indeed, when we look at cells, um, when we look at the, the media, sorry, uh, we do see a nice arc band in and um, this suggested that ARC was being released into the media and was potentially in some sort of uh, vesicle. Uh, that same fraction, we could also detect ARC uh, mRNA, and uh, this RNA was uh, uh, protected from RNAs, exogenous RNAs, uh, suggesting that it was either in a, in a, again in a vesicle or some sort of protected environment. Um, and so one question that we had even, you know, really early on was um, what kind of vesicle was ARC in? Uh, and so this is actually unpublished work where we've been trying to uh, perfect immunogold labeling of vesicles from neurons. Um, so this is, this is a field of view that shows many different kinds of vesicles, but there's only a couple of them that have uh, a, this large gold particle uh, in them, and, and we and this corroborates some of the other EM data that we've got showing that ARC is only in a subset of vesicles. Um, and if you blow up these vesicles, you actually see maybe th this dark density that could be the capsid. So the, these are large uh, 50 nanometer gold particles. Um, so, you know, the, there's a lot of tricky aspects to this. You have to permeabilize the, um, the EVs with low detergent, and so. We're still, uh, we're still trying to perfect this, but it's sort of the first steps to figure out what kind of uh, vesicles ARC is actually um, in. Um, we wanted to know if the release of ARC into the media was activity dependent. Um, and so we know that if you add this drug uh, by Cuclin that upregulates activity in the cultures, uh, we see more ARC being made in the cells and we do indeed see further increase in release of ARC into the cell, uh, into the media. So um, we, at this point, we don't know if this is just because we are making more ARC protein in cells or if there's uh, particular aspects of uh, ED release that um, uh, are activity dependent. So of course, um, 
you know, one of the big challenges here that everyone in the EV field faces is how to ice these EV. And, uh, this was again all ultra centrifugation uh, protocols, but we've um, we've started to explore these um, these ison columns, these mini columns that I'm sure everyone's familiar with, um, and we we think that that these ison columns potentially are much more cleaner in that you can separate out the vesicular fraction from the protein junk. Um, and so if we do this from the media we collect from primary culture neurons, um, this is the basal expression of ARC in these fractions. Um, and as you can see in the protein concentration, these later fractions is where we think most of that protein junk is. Um, and then when you upregulate activity, you start to see arc in these um, in these fractions, these heavier fractions that would contain um, the extracellular vesicles. Uh, one one sort of um, observation I'm just going to throw out there, and then we can also talk about is where else can we detect arc? Um, long story is that we we actually felt like arc may be in in blood and serum. For various reasons, and we've just started to look at that that aspect of um, of this biology. And so these are again the ison columns from um, plasma. We have an arc knockout uh, mouse um, or a couple of mice that we've collected, and this is a this is actually a GFP fusion protein that we uh, transgenic that we're sort of um, using to boost arc expression. Um, and intriguingly, we do start, we do actually see um, arc in the blood in these um, fractions that we predict would have um, some of these extracellular vesicles. <coughs> but uh, I express that this is just preliminary and we, we're still trying to figure out if this is a, a real uh, result. Okay, so um, many questions here to also still address. Um, we are, we wanna know um, is arc biogenesis of these EVs, are they actually going through a classic exosome pathway or are they being released directly from the plasma membrane? Uh, are they escort dependent? Um, our preliminary data, at least in hex cells, suggests that they're, they're potentially not hex cell, um, uh, escort, they're not escort dependent. And this partly due to the fact that we know that ARC actually doesn't have that P6 domain that the, the viral HIV does. Um, of course, we want to know what else is in these ARC extracellular vesicles. What are the um, we're using proteomics and RNA sequencing approaches, um, similar to where the capsid uh, is being formed. We want to know whether we can uh, see where ARC is being released in neurons. Um, what kind of activity regulating uh, or pathways for controlling ARC EV release? Um, and can we actually again visualize a capsid structure in an extracellular vesicle? The negative stain EM approach is not going to allow us to do that. Potentially, the, the cryo EM approach um, will. But of course, you know, given that arc is only in a subset of those vesicles that are coming out of neurons, and since the capsid we think is inside the, the membrane, um, we don't really have a good way of. Um, using an antibody, for example, to isolate the ARC-only EVs at this point. Okay, so then finally, given all that, that I've shown you, we predicted that ARC could be um, uh, transmitting RNA from cell to cell in, an, in a virus-like me uh, mechanism. Um, I'm showing here some, uh, actually some initial data from Mike um, when he was in Tom Gallagher's lab. Uh, here he's just using hex cells, and this is sort of a, a, a split reporter system where the EV producer cells have one um, side of the GFP or, or nanoreciprase. And then when you see um, fluorescence in the recipient cells, this could be uh, due to potentially either the protein being trafficked and delivered or even the mRNA being delivered and then being made um, in the recipient cell. Um, and so, um, so Mike expressed ARC and hex cells and then isolated extracellular vesicles and then just wanted to see if there's um, reporter RNA in the vesicles. Um, and indeed, when you express ARC alone, uh, sorry, if you, when you express CD9, which is the tetraspanin that you're familiar with, you get some uh, reporter um, released. But when you add ARC, you get a significant boost in 
um, the release of our, uh, release of these um, e these reporters in vesicles. And then if you look at the um, the fluorescence in the recipient cells, um, you'll also see a very nice um, increase in delivery of cargo to those cells. At this point, you don't know yet if it's uh, the protein itself or if, if there's RNA being uh, actually made in those recipient cells, but it's um, intriguing. Um, one of the aspects is if you, if you, you that you, uh, of the hex cell data at least, is that you need to have expression of some of these tetraspanins plus ARC to get robust uh, RNA in these extracellular vesicles that are isolated from, um, from these, these hex cells. But of course, we're mostly interested in neurons, and we think that the, the hex cells actually lack quite a lot of the machinery for uh, release and production of, of normal ARC uh, vesicles. Um, and so we, we're really concentrating on neurons. And so some of the initial experiments we wanted to do is which we wanted to take these ARC knockouts um, and use them as our recipient cells. So here on this on the left, you have the protein expression and the mRNA expression on the right. And so you can see um, in our condition in our wild type neurons, you have nice expression of protein and RNA. And uh, one of the crazy experiments I think that that um, we did or that actually seemed to work was that we took those recombinant capsids and added them to these neurons to see if they would be taken up by the neurons. And again, these recombinant um, capsids we think don't have a membrane per se. Uh, and, and indeed, we do see uh, evidence for uptake into these knockout neurons within an hour, um, even in these dendrites and even evidence for some synaptic uh, localization. And then what was quite, quite striking was that um, even though you start to see uptake of the protein within an hour, you don't really see a lot of RNA until much later, about four hours into um, the incubation, but this, but at this point, there is really robust delivery of RNA even in uh, these dendrites. Uh, and one explanation we have, we think we have for this delay is potentially that the the capsids have to disassemble in the cell, and that there's machinery that has that in neurons that, that allows this to happen, but it's a slow process, and that you can only access the the RNA uh, later on. Um, the uptake of these capsids is endocytosis dependent. If you use dinosaur, you basically block all uptake um, and you certainly block the delivery of the RNA into cells. So this seems to be a regulated process. Um, and then finally, of course, the endogenous protein, we want to know if, if um, this happens uh, as well. And so here we we took um, the extracellular vesicle fraction from wild type neurons, the media from wild type neurons, or um, uh, or knockout um, uh, media from knockout neurons, and then incubated them with recipient cells. Um, and so, of course, if we take uh, vesicles from knockouts, um, we don't see any increase or uptake of protein or RNA. But in our wild type conditions, um, uh, sorry, wild type EEV conditions, we do see uptake of protein. And then in a very similar uh, uh, way, we see uptake of the ARC mRNA from these vesic vesic extracellular vesicles. Um, of course, these vesicles are purified from media and they're concentrated so that these are, there are fairly high uh, concentrations here. Um, but the dynamics seem to be quite similar to the recombinant capsids. And then, you know, one aspect of this, of course, is that we want to know if the delivery of the RNA is actually occurring in the cytoplasm. Can um, the mRNA get out of endosomes? And one way to show this, we again we use this trick to induce local translation of endogenous ARC mRNA um, in neurons. And so, if you do this in um, where you, in conditions where you've added these knockout EVs, you don't really see any change. But when you uh, incubate um, with wild-type extracellular vesicles and then add the drug, you see a, a further increase in protein expression uh, that's blocked by cyclohexamide, which is a protein synthesis uh, inhibitor. 
Um, so this suggests that the ARC MRI that's being delivered ca can be accessible to being translated in the cytoplasm of, of these uh, knockout neurons. Um, I would say it's not the gold standard of this experiment. We'd like to really identify uh, de novo translation. Uh, and so we have some experiments planned to do that. You, you also notice that this antibody has some background in the knockout. And so it's, it's not as clean as the RNA. Um, and so, but we think that this is at least um, giving us hints that uh, ARC has the ability to, uh, to deliver RNA and actually have a fair amount of that RNA escape the endosome. All right, so just to sort of summarize our, our model at this point, um, we, we think then that ARC mRNA is trafficked out into these dendrites. There's uh, enough mRNA out in these dendrites to make enough copies to make uh, capsids. Uh, and so we think that potentially these capsids are forming in dendrites and then encapsulating RNA that could be proximal. And so one uh, way to get specificity of what is being encapsulated is actually uh, uh, facial proximity. But of course, the, there's also potentially um, uh, sequence uh, specificity and we'd love to know if that, that is actually the case. Um, and then we, we, at this point, we, we think that ARC is actually being released directly from the cell surface, that it, it, it probably is not going through a classic exosome pathway. Um, but I, I would say we haven't really got any definitive data yet to, to, to show that. Um, and then, of course, once uh, ARC is released in, um, in these ACK bars, and I don't know if anyone got this in the paper, but this was my lab's nerdy uh, Star Wars reference where uh, Admiral Akbar has this famous line, it's a trap. Um, and so these Akbar's of course contain RNA and proteins in the vesicle. Um, and we would love to know where they go once they're released. Right here with this model, we have uh, another neuron taking up um, these vesicles and we, we have evidence for that. But we're also looking to see if these um, uh, Aquas can also be taken up by non-neuronal cells like glia, and then even potentially being um, uh, released into uh, a, into the CSF or, or, or into blood. Um, and this is just to remind uh, right, remind you about the the fly biology, and um, and so Vivian Budnick's group actually published this paper back to back with ours. Can be made in these neuromuscular junctions of flies. This is a, a specialized synapse, essentially. And they, they actually came at this from a very different way. They're actually looking for which uh, proteins were highly expressed in extracellular vesicles um, in, in fly cells. And they um, use an unbiased approach to isolate the, the DOC uh, proteins because they, and RNA, because both of them were highly expressed in extracellular vesicles. Um, and we all, because um, uh, we went on to show that the, the, the mammalian arc can form capsids and that the fly arc can, can form capsids, um, they um, have some evidence that there's capsids being formed as well by the fly arc and that these um, vesicles can transfer RNA uh, into the muscle and that if you block this process, you actually um, interfere with the normal uh, development of this synapse. But this, to me, this is you know, really striking because as I mentioned, we think that the origins of this particular gene are different to the mammalian gene, but what has been retained is this CA gag-like domain and that the biology uh, has been retained as well um, where there are, capsid-like structures that can be formed by these um, proteins. And then this uh, results in a unique kind of vesicle that's being produced. Um, and you know, we're also interested, as I mentioned early on, about disease aspects. Uh, I won't go into detail here, but we want to know if ARC is involved in uh, neurodegenerative disorders, either through propagation of pathology through uh, vesicles. We already have some uh, data um, published a while ago showing that if you um, take an ARC knockout and cross it to an Alzheimer's model, you actually get less plaque pathology and less uh, toxic proteins being made. 
Um, and uh, so we, we're following up on this observation as well with this new added um, question of whether ARC is actually propagating uh, pathology through vesicles. Um, and so again, you know, more questions and answers, um, and there's some really low hanging fruit here about cargo. Um, we would, we still want to definitely show that capsids form in neurons, and what pathway are they actually going through in terms of the biogenesis? Um, uh, you know, of course, I haven't talked about this side of the, um, the process, but we want to know what are the uptake mechanisms, what are the specificity, is there, what's the efficiency of um, tra de novo translation? And then from a neuroscience perspective, of course, we're very interested in what the overall function is of this pathway in terms of memory. Um, and then there's some really cool potential um, applications for this. So again, I just want to thank the lab. So these are the people whose work that I mentioned um, and, and other members of the lab. And then our wonderful collaborator here at Utah um, and um, outside of Utah, <clears throat> and then um, our funding mechanisms. And it looks like there's questions, so I'll, I'll take uh, questions now. Great, well, thanks very much indeed, uh, Jason. This was an amazing presentation. I learned a lot. Um, we, have, we do have some questions, so we would, like to, um, we would like to trap you for a little bit, if you can give us another 10 minutes or so, is that all right? Yeah, no, no problem, I'm happy to stick around. All right, excellent. So um, I just wanted to start with a comment because I think that the biology of retroviruses, um, uh, you know, might 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 give us some directions here too. Because uh, several of our questions were actually about the biogenesis pathways. So is this you know canonical endosomal, you know exosomal kind of uh, production or from the plasma membrane? And it's really interesting if you look at the history of HIV research. Uh, for a while, it was thought that HIV was uh, was kind of an exosome, right? So then it was it was discovered, uh, or it was I guess I guess it was shown that for T cells anyway, HIV seemed to be released from the plasma membrane. Uh, but for, with macrophages, there was um, there was uh, some ambiguity, and it turned out that the macrophages were actually releasing uh, HIV into what looked like internal compartments, but they were actually just invaginations of the plasma membrane. So they were not true, um, right. not true endosomes. So it was very, very interesting that, um, you know, depending, I mean, we have to be open to the possibility that, you know, the way that we're doing our staining, the way that we're doing our sectioning, um, is important in, in getting to that answer. So I just wanted to make a comment about that. Um, you know, and then also because I'm interested in small RNAs, uh, you know, HIV is an example of how um, a virus can take along with it host RNAs as well. Um, you know, so, so uh, HIV uses a host tRNA to prime its own reverse transcription um, and thus brings along some of these, um, these copies of the tRNA with it um, inside its capsid. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated, fascinated to see how this um, unfolds and whether there are other RNAs, you know, that may not even be bound directly to the ARC protein that could be taken along with those, those capsids. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, um, the, the retrovirus literature has been a wonderful resource for us. And, um, you know, we're a bit lucky that we have Sanquist here who's really helped us um, navigate that literature. And, um, <clears throat> you know, so there's a lot of precedent here, but, I'll, you know, I gave a talk to the retrovirology uh, crowd at the Cold Spring Harbor meeting and a lot of them were like, well, this is impossible. This is not, not what HIV does. How come you can, you know, you don't need um, the other aspects of HIV proteins to get out of the cell. And, um, and so, you know, just a reminder, this is not a virus. So it's not going to be totally the same. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Some, some differences there. So, so let me, um, I have just, um, I've just changed the settings so people can unmute themselves. And we have a few questions that have come up. The first, um, I'd like to ask uh, Maria Elena Ciccardi to, uh, to unmute yourself, please, and ask your questions about, um, about activity. Sure. Hi, uh, great talk. I, I had a question about the, the activity dependent release of these arc particles uh, and that you said that are uh, also EVs uh, and uh, I wanted to know if you tried other uh, activity stimulator and if you try to abate activity with some uh, like for example TTX 
conducted in like that to see if you can revert the production of these vesicles. And in general, if you think that activity can uh, in general increase the production of EVs regardless of the, if they are ARC positive. <clears throat> right, the conditions we, um, we are doing those experiments. We, um, I would, unfortunately, I don't have any definitive answers yet for most of those. What we do know is that if you just upregulate activity in general, you do get extra, um, more release of both arc containing EVs and EVs in general. Um, and then we were obviously not the first to show that. There's been um, really similar from Remy Sadu's lab, you know, a while back showing that you can get um, neuronal EVs um, being rapidly released with um, glutamate stimulation. But yeah, so those, those are the experiments that we would like to do. What kind of activity um, is involved in, in the release mechanism and can we decouple that from the actual synthesis of the protein in the cells um, and whether, you know, how all that's controlled. Great, thanks. Thanks, for the, thanks for the question. Um, and our next, uh, our next questions are from Erez. So Erez, you had a couple of questions. First of all, thank you for a great uh, presentation. And I have two questions. One is regarding the specificity to ARC RNA. And if you think there is any relevancy to the location of the RNA to protein translation, because I know that some of the RNA is going to translate in the synapse and maybe those are more specific to those capsules. And this is why you see the difference between ARC and GAPTH. And in that case, did you, me did you measure other uh, RNA that are uh, synaptic translated. And uh, the other question is, we know that ERC regulate a, a synaptic receptor like AMPA like you presented in the beginning, and we know that they are released in exosomes. Do you see a difference in the release uh, uh, in the knockout ARC versus the not knockout ARC and, and they have participated in that uh, aspect? Yeah, um, so good questions again. Uh, so the first one, yes, uh, in terms of the specificity of the RNA, um, we, when we did the IP and then RNA sequencing, we actually did not see a lot of other R R mRNAs. Really, mRNA was the most enriched and um, uh, the predominant species were small RNAs. And so, um, again, those are from the IP. And so we don't know if that's uh, going to be consistent with extracellular vesicle cargo, um, those are ongoing experiments as well. Um, but yeah, we're very interested to know where, what, where the RNA is, where encapsulation is happening. Um, there were some intriguing nuclear, potentially nuclear RNAs, um, small snow RNAs that we pulled out. And so, um, and we actually know that there's a fair amount of arc protein in the nucleus, then we don't know what it's doing there. Um, so again, sort of no clear answer yet, but we hope that that would be informative. Um, and then the AMP receptors, um, yeah, so we, we are also looking at whether the knockout EVs, arc knockout EVs, um, have altered, um, uh, composition, um, and, and unfortunately still don't have a definitive answer on that either. Um, but, you know, this does also... Uh, have an interesting uh, question about whether the amperes the trafficking function of ARC is related to the vesicles. And um, right now, actually, we think that the uh, trafficking role at synapses must be done by a monomeric version of ARC. Um, and there's some evidence that actually when ARC is interacting with the neurotransmitter receptors, that actually blocks the ability of ARC to, to oligomerize. And so there's actually a switch involved in um, the synaptic uh, protein where it's monomeric. But then the question, of course, is once it's taken the receptors out of the synapse, uh, is there a continuum of the life cycle and that at some point then it forms an oligomer um, and then it's still carrying the receptors with them and maybe this is just a quick way of getting rid of those receptors. So um, we're, we wanna test that idea. Great, thanks. Um, our next question um, is from An Phan. 
Um, and maybe the specificity question has been addressed, but you also had a question about, um, about function. Oh, uh, wonderful uh, talk. So uh, I was wondering if you could uh, comment whether the uh, loading up the uh, cargo into the um, into this into the uh, vesicles follow the uh, passive or active loading mechanism, like whether it just follow the law of pass action or it have some kind of uh, RNA binding protein help transport the. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah. you know, so the, the experiments that we that I showed briefly about in hex cells suggest that um, the, the, there is passive loading of protein. So if we express, if we co-express GFP for, or any, um, you know, soluble cellular, cellular um, protein, it will be packaged in RQVs. What was interesting, though, is that the enrichment of RNA of the reporters and, and, and um, of ARC RNA it's what, it seemed to be way higher than you would predict if it was passive loading. And so, um, so one idea is that, um, you know, ARC, the, the, the reason why you want an ARC cat is now it's conferring some sort of specificity to RNA trafficking versus protein trafficking. Um, but in terms of what the specificity is, and, you know, going back to the previous question, we still don't really know what uh, yet, and at least in neurons as well, what, what that happened, what that is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I think a related question is from Yua Zhang. Uh, Yua, do you want to ask about uh, about what this means for the capsid formation? Maybe maybe that question was um, was answered then. Yeah, I mean, um, we do think the at least the recombinant protein capsid formation does require nucleic acid interactions, um, and um, but whether that is required in vivo, we don't know, and so we're, we're still trying to figure out ways to, you know, mutate ARC uh, that would allow, you know, you that you could still get, hopefully, capsid formation, but you wouldn't get RNA. Good. Okay. So I'm looking through the questions here. Pablo, Pablo, was your question answered um, about the uh, about the functional studies, or did you have yeah. something else you wanted to ask about? No, it was similar to what uh, Jason showed. Like, uh, take the extracellular vesicle from the wild type and then treat the knockout. But I was thinking the same uh, kind of rationale, and then measure the electrophysiology in those neurons to see if you can modify the activity of the neuron with this. And thinking forward, like you mentioned it during your presentation, like uh, uh, think very crazy. Can we improve memory with artificial arc or recombinant recombinant arc in the future? Yeah, uh, yeah. What if that could be great? Just snort some arc and you get smarter, huh? Um, yeah. So those are good questions as well. We are uh, now doing the electrophysiology, or we plan to do the electrophysiology studies once we can go back to the lab properly um, and uh, and also seeing if we can rescue some of the um, you know amperceptor trafficking defects in the knockout cells with uh, with the wild type extracellular vesicles um, so yeah we want to know that um, in terms of the gene delivery idea um, I we there is, we did we, I do have a spin-off company that's now looking at this in, in various ways and it's too early to know whether it will be at all uh, viable, but it's it's definitely a very you know, interesting. And yeah, whether we could actually use this as a self-delivery of ARC itself from memory, that would be pretty amazing. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So in the interest of time, I think I'm just going to, um, to bring up a couple of the additional issues um, and then we'll conclude for today. But there were some uh, some questions about um, you know we've been looking at neurons here. You've been telling us all about neurons. What about other cells? I mean, is, are these going to be delivered to uh, to other cells in the brain, like glial cells? And is it even possible that there is some communication between the periphery and the central nervous system, um, and even expression in the in the periphery? Yeah, exactly. Um, we we don't have any definitive evidence yet for glia uptake, um, but there is some intriguing evidence actually. Uh, this, um, there was a, uh, a neuroscience, an SFN poster 
from uh, Peter Rapp's group at NIH and um, uh, there's another group um, at UT Dallas that have reported expression of, of ARC in peripheral neurons and then potentially release of ARC from those peripheral neurons and into um, um, other cells, epithelial cells, potentially even in the skin. Um, so I think, you know, this is just a, potentially the tip of the iceberg. The, the blood, the observation of, of ARC in blood, you know, we don't know yet if that is um, protein that's coming out of the brain uh, and being produced by central nervous system cells, or is it a peripheral nerve, uh, or is it a peripheral cell type that is producing it? And so we, we, we have experiments on, to, to tease that out as well. Um, and if, it, if that is the case, and if it is getting out of the brain, you know, why? Why would you want to have a signal that goes from brain to a peripheral cell? And, you know, maybe this is even potentially a brain, you know, uh, immunology kind of um, question. Great. Well, um, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today, Jason. Uh, for sharing your time and your knowledge. And um, I think you've, you've given us a lot of food for thought and uh, we're looking forward to see, you know, what else is gonna be coming out of your lab very soon. Um, so, so thank you and thanks everyone for joining. I hope to see you next week on both Monday and Wednesday. Thanks all. Take yeah, thanks, Ann. Um, and if anyone even wants to follow up by email, feel free to, you know, email me as well. Perfect, thank you. Thank you all.